Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. In this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast, I want to take a moment to take you through how to build a business in Australia. Getting started, the things you need to know, including all of the paperwork, the back office, the admin, the marketing, all of the tips and tricks that I can think of in as little as 30 minutes. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. Have you ever sat back and thought that maybe you can do it better? If you're the type of person like I am, chances are you would have thought that quite a few times while you're out working, when you interact with a business, or when you see someone else running their own business, you think, maybe that could be done better, and maybe there's an idea there for me to go and pursue. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is all about starting a business in Australia. I'm going to give you a brief background on how I started our business, and some of the key takeaways and lessons learned so you can fast track your own, I guess, project or business idea. One thing I want to emphasize, though, is if you enjoy this episode, can you please email me? Because for many years, I've wanted to do a business podcast where I share some introductory episodes and interview some founders and and business owners, whether they be small business owners or large business owners, to try and help other people in Australia unearth and unlock that entrepreneurial spirit that we all kind of feel deep down inside. So if you like this episode, please email me. You'll find a link in the show notes. First, I figured a really good way to get started on this journey was to talk about my story starting a business. For those who don't know, the RAS Group or RASC Australia, which is the business that we've created, is a business that services people online. We give investment advice. We do um, at podcasts, we do articles, we do all different types of videos, courses, all these different things that kind of revolve around the finance industry. And we've got a big marketing focus naturally because, hey, you need to sell your products too. And in the online world, content is king. So the story for my business goes back to long before actually the inception date or when, you know, I started the business by opening um, a business account at my bank and, and all those types of things. In my opinion, good businesses don't just start on day one. What they tend to come from is something that you've looked at and thought for a long time. Maybe I could do that better. Maybe I'm really passionate about this area and I should pursue something here. So we'll get to how businesses are different to a side hustle in just a moment. But my my journey started many years before 2017, which is the official date you'll be able to see on our website on our About Us page. My journey started probably five years before that. I was really passionate about education and, and investing and educating other people to use their money the, use their money better rather. And so I knew kind of where I wanted to be, but I didn't know exactly the expression that I was going to pursue for the business. I knew, you know, I wanted to help people. Yeah, finance was a traditionally untrustworthy industry, so I wanted to bring some trust back to that. I thought there was a real opportunity there. And obviously there were some trailblazers in this industry like Scott Pape and a few others in the industry. But I'd spent years um, out of in uni and then out of uni thinking about this idea. So first of all, I, I started studying and I did a degree and I did two more. So it wasn't like an overnight thing. Um, in fact, I started studying, I did two degrees after my first degree. And then I did some more study on top of that just so I knew exactly all of the different things that go into running a business in the finance industry. And when you study, typically what you get is you get the nuts and bolts approach to, I guess, how to be a good employee. You learn all the technical stuff. But when you need to become a manager or when you need to become a leader in a business, the skill set is a lot softer. You don't necessarily go to school to learn those things. So that's something that you need to learn and you need to piece together through your own experiences and through your own, I guess, disciplined learning and, and study and reading. That's a really important point. And it's something that is underestimated. You know, oftentimes the best people, the people who get into um, really good businesses, either as a manager or as a founder, they're often not the smartest people, but they're often 
very charismatic or they're very uh, culturally focused. So they, they help people and they're very supportive of getting the most out of their team. I've heard one really, uh, I guess, quirky founder say that all he tries to do is be the glass house for all the flowers that are inside. And effectively, he just provides the environment and lets all the wonderful people inside the business do their thing. So you can think about all those different, I guess, knowledge requirements for you as a business owner. How do you want to piece it together? One of the things that I I knew was kind of happening right in front of my eyes was this uh, collision between technology and finance. A lot of traditional finance businesses were kind of, they were running on this old model of one-to-one where you'd go sit down with a client and then you'd have some sort of interaction with them. I thought, well, that's got to change because that created barriers to entry. Thousands or potentially millions of Australians needed access to information. And my point here is not to gloat or to boast about the opportunity in my industry, but it's more to say to you that this was an opportunity. There was an opportunity in this industry that I wasn't making up. So I wasn't lying to myself about how, you know, I could create this cool brand and, you know, we would sell these things. There was actually a genuine need here. And I knew that the size of this opportunity was big enough to support a wage for me, firstly, but also to build a company out of. Some businesses or some ideas simply aren't that. So some businesses, and that's okay, simply aren't big enough for you to have a full-time income from. So I'm talking about a lot of, um, you know, side hustles or, or things you do on the side. Um, you know, whether it be a hobby or something like that, there is a noticeable difference. And I would say the first hurdle to get over is, can you, like, is the demand actually there? Can you make a business? And I'm talking about profit, not just the sales. I'll get to that in a moment. But can you actually make a business that makes enough money to support you and your family? It's just pretty pretty much as simple as that. And so that's kind of like the first hurdle you need to, to get over. But Another one is, and probably a more important one, is the intellectual or the mental requirement. It's not only good enough just to have an idea, you actually have to earn your stripes. You have to actually go out there, you have to pound the pavement, you have to make a fool of yourself, you have to be prepared to lose it all. In Australia, we have this, I guess, this really tough culture problem that we need to kick. And that's this tall poppy syndrome. A lot of us think that, you know, there's safety in numbers. Maybe, maybe, maybe our economy, as I write this, is coming unstuck for this very reason right now. But the tall poppy syndrome tells us that we shouldn't stick our head above the crowd and try things because, you know, there's safety. It's not a good thing. You'll get a lot of flack. So people will come at you and say, you're doing this wrong. You know, you'll have to give up a lot, which is, again, something I'll get to in just a moment. But you have to be prepared to hustle. You have to be prepared to go out there, really grind to make um, the first few years work because no business is a success overnight. We all have this tendency to set our ambitions pretty high. I did this. I definitely did this because it's a coping strategy and it's a way for us to justify starting a business. It is so hard to start a business. It is so very, very, very hard. So many businesses fail and even those that don't fail, almost all of them don't make a profit in the first two, three, four, five years. It is not an easy thing to do. However, if you do get through all of that, the rewards can be a plenty. You know, there's not only financial rewards, but there's lifestyle rewards up for grabs too. Someone first said to me when I started my business, you know, there's no such thing as an, <laughs> there's no such thing as an overnight success, but maybe there's an overnight success in 10 years. You know, what people see from the outside is definitely not what you see from the inside. You know, we can think of, I guess, that duck that swims past us in the pond. It looks like it's just cruising on by when really its feet are paddling like crazy underneath the surface. And that's the way I kind of describe all small businesses. It's just this madness that you have to hustle every single day and work so hard just to keep pace with where you are, but then move forward. So I had to earn my stripes and long before I started the business, I had to work hard and and learn what I could. I knew that finance and now, technology was intersecting somewhere. I didn't know where it was going to be. I just knew that I had to understand technology and I had to have the technical skills in finance for anyone to take me seriously. So I had to go away and study that. And that required a lot of sacrifice. You know, people say to you, um, you know, oh, isn't it wonderful to run your own business? Yeah, it is. Um, but I can tell you right now, if you're listening to this when I produce it in June 2020, this is really the first time in the last four years I've taken a wage. So, you know, the rewards go to those people who do put in the hard yards. But if you start a business thinking that you're going to make money and that is your sole focus, 
I can almost guarantee it's going to fail. I can almost guarantee that. Because when things get really, really hard, it's almost impossible to keep that long-term vision uh, and that passion for what you're doing you know, in front of you, that carrot dangling in front of you. If that carrot, if that carrot does not exist, you haven't actually earned anything. So when you start a business, really think about what it is that you want to achieve. Is your passion solely money? If it is, if you think about the absolute financial loss that you can suffer from starting a business, which, by the way, is everything that you have, maybe even plus some, versus the upside you get from that, maybe say a 20% chance that your business is a success and that it does extremely well is probably another you know, 5% of that 20%, so not much at all. If you think about that, you're actually much better off just staying as a PAYG, staying as an employee, keeping your business small if you're self-employed, rather than going all out and risking it all. So think about that before you go and start a business. Make sure that firstly, it is a business and an industry that can support your your role. You have the skills, you've put in the hard yards to, to really make a name for yourself in this industry and you deserve it. And then be prepared because it's going to take a long time and make sure your, make sure your motives for doing a business and for starting a business are intact. Melissa Brown, who wrote the book, Unf Your Finances, and that's the PG version, she wrote the book, Unf Your Finances. And when she said, she has this section on budgeting and um, cutting, I guess, the fat from your budget. And what she says is, it's not about, you know, just cutting one thing here or there. What budgeting and what successful money management is all about is knowing what you are prepared to sacrifice. And I think that's a really important thing for business. Because if you prepared, if you are prepared to start a business, what you are actually saying is you are prepared to sacrifice a lot. I remember not being able to go to birthday parties because I was studying or because I was working. Even today, I answer um, our members or our customers' emails at 11 o'clock on a Friday night after I get home from going to the movies or out for dinner. Um, you know, I, I will be working at 7 a.m. On a, on a Sunday morning when everyone else in the house is asleep. And that's something that I have to do because it's my business. And you must have to be prepared to do if you run your own business. So I guess the, th- the next step is after we've got through this, this whole big idea, this whole big challenge of, um, you know, just getting the motivation and making sure our intentions are pure and right and we're all focused and that type of thing. And then we're ready to do it. We've, we've spoken to maybe our partners and they're on board because I tell you what, if you don't have a good partner or you don't have a good support network around you, chances are the business will fail. I often joke, my wife and I often joke that she's my sugar mama because she's had the stable job this whole time and she's worked hard to make this business a reality. So I owe her more than I owe anyone else. And when it gets really tough, those are the people who will help you. Those are the people who will get you through. So make sure you develop that support network. But after we've got through kind of this big idea, you know, we've got starry eyes, we're thinking, wonderful, we'll go and start this business. We've got a great idea. Well, what are the next steps? Most people call this planning. I've met people to have, who have businesses and they have business plans, get this, that are 85 or 90 pages long. Just, start, just writing a business plan that is 80 or 90 pages is pretty much a business in itself. That is a lot of work, right? Because it's not just like, you're not just holding down the W keyboard and just holding it until it gets to 90 pages on your Word document. It's actually, you know, research, it's um, strategy, it's what's the best uh, thing to do under this circumstance. But that's a business plan that is probably, you know, I would say a bit extreme. I definitely didn't have anything like that in mind. But what I mean when I talk about planning is just getting the right information on board. You don't need to make financial forecasts for a very long time because particularly as a new business um, you might think to yourself yeah well I have this really good idea but it's not a full-time business for me yet and I don't need to go to the bank and get a loan which is uh, one party who will require a business plan Um, I don't need to go and sell some of my company to shareholders because I don't need funding right now so you know when we talk about planning we're talking about more than just what's written in a document or a spreadsheet. So first things first, Warren Buffett has this phrase, don't test the water with both feet. And so don't just jump in willy-nilly. Make sure that you are prepared to um, build the business up while you're also working. Because if you work at a standard nine to five job now, 
um, and then you go straight into a business, I can tell you what, you're going to be working 12 hour days for a good couple of years, maybe even six or seven days a week to get your business off the ground. So why not start on that path now? Why not work your nine to five like I did and then do some things out of hours to try and um, get some of that headway uh, underway? So, you know, you can start planning, you can start opening accounts, you can start uh, researching and doing all those things kind of on the side. And that's where we talk about, you know, not testing the water with both feet. Just dip one foot in, dip another toe in, then dip your whole ankle in. Then once it starts to earn money, and only then maybe do you start to put both feet in. What I did early on, which is something that I think is really important or was really important to me, was I sat down and on just a single piece of paper, you could even say it was an envelope. I sat down and I wrote down the three major risks for my business. I don't need to repeat them here, but there were three major risks or obstacles, things that would make my vision not come true. And then what I did is I put down a way to get through them. So I went away and researched those three risks, everything about them. I would say that those three things, which are really important in the finance industry, are things that people still haven't even worked out are a risk and we're three years down the track from where I identified them. And so you want to write those three things down and then you want to, underneath them, you want to write down strategies to get over them. How do you overcome those hurdles? How do you get by those obstacles that are in your way? You'll be surprised how creative you have to be when there's something in front of your idea and you're driven enough to think about it. So as I, as I said before, start slowly, start very slowly, use it as a side hustle at first and then push into it. You know, one of the things that I say is that don't invest everything into it straight away because you're going to need to invest everything into it eventually. So only invest what you need to at the time. One of the most important things you'll have to do if you start a business is to think about all the different things that you can do yourself. Investing in yourself is probably the most important thing to do in a modern business because chances are a lot of it you can learn or do yourself. So for example, I didn't really know that much about marketing. And now I feel like I'm like, I don't even know what an analogy would be, but I'm so far advanced in my marketing that I could be employed as a marketer now and probably a pretty good one. And so when you like podcasting was never on my radar, but now it is. And I learned how to do that. And I learned what equipment I needed. I learned the best ways to edit this podcast myself if I had to. I learned all of those things. Thanks to the wonder of YouTube and the internet, you can find the answers to everything pretty quickly. And so you want to do as much of that as you can early on so you don't have to pay out for that um, expense because consultants and, and freelancers, which we're about to get to, are extremely expensive. So invest, if, invest in yourself and learn everything you need to learn because you're going to go from a technician, let's say you're a plumber and you want to start a business, soon you'll realize that, yeah, sure, you can know everything there is to know about stormwater or downpipes or pits or whatever you want to know. But when you start managing people, you start running a business, you start having accounts at Bunnings, at Reese, at wherever you shop, you start to realize, holy heck, there's a lot more than just digging a hole, putting pipes in, putting glue around it. Um, that's an overgeneralization, but you get the idea. You could say the same thing if you're, if you're a designer. You know, there's a lot to do before you go out and actually design things, and you're going to have to have a whole new range of skill sets that are going to be more valuable to you than actually designing. So keep that in mind. Now, I think I've waffled on for long enough. I promised you half an hour. I've got about 13 minutes to go. And in the next 13 minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of the major different kind of bureaucratic or just legal jargon things that you need to uh, get by and understand to start a business in Australia. So these are all the questions that I wish I could just sit down with someone who's done it before so they could teach me what to do. Because some of these things, no matter how many different tutorials you read online, they're just not obvious and they don't make sense. So if you've got a pen and paper handy, you can probably hear me getting mine out. I've got a list of things that I'm going to tell you and they're all in the show notes or most of them are in the show notes. You probably don't need that pen and paper. I'm going to tell you the things you need to know and I'm going to be very, very general. And then if you want me to go into these and expand on these ideas, please send me that email. You'll find a link in the, in the show notes and we'll do full episodes on each of these areas. So I'm going to start at the top. I'm going to start with the mental aspect of starting a business. I just spoke about how it takes its toll on you. Be prepared. If you start a business, no matter how big or small, it is going to take up some of your time. 
And that time and energy and effort has to come from somewhere. So one of the things that you might be prepared to do, or you might have to be prepared to do, is give up time with your family, with your friends, with your kids, with your parents, with your brothers, with your sisters. You may have to give up that uh, time and that energy that you would norm- that would normally go to them to do this thing. So be prepared. If you need advice on this, there are great communities online. Um, there are business coaches, which you might choose to use. There are people who have been in business before that will give you advice and will counsel you and help you manage your time and they'll help you, um, I guess, see the bigger picture. But be prepared. You're probably going to be the only one who's in this. You're going to be the one that's sacrificing this time and effort with and energy with your family to go and do this. So be prepared for that. Financial. One of the most important things that people start off with when they start a business is they start with a business plan. And they go, this is going to be my sales for the first year. So sales is everything that goes through your business. If you have a coffee shop, you sell a coffee for $3, that's a $3 coffee, that's $3 in sales. Every time that someone orders that coffee, it's another $3 for your business. And then obviously we have costs, and the costs would be the milk, the coffee, the coffee machine, all these different things. And the difference between what you get, the $3, and what you pay for the coffee, for the coffee beans and for the milk and for the machine is, at the end of the day, your profit. Most people who start businesses um, don't understand financials that well. And so what happens is they might be a really good uh, technician or a technical person, but what they don't understand is the actual profits of the business and how does that work. And so this is where a good accountant or someone who uh, has, I guess, literacy in this area can help you out. But I would encourage anyone to go away and take like a basic business course or a basic thing on YouTube just to understand how things work. Because one of the most important things is that your business eventually makes a profit and you understand all the different costs that go into making an end product. Um, One of the things you can do is you can understand, by doing that, you can understand how long um, you have until your cash runs out that you might have saved up yourself. You understand if you need to go to the bank and get a loan and then you can talk their language. What do they want to see? What, you know, what do... How much do you need and what equipment are you going to buy and all these different types of things. Another thing that people don't think about when they start a business is selling equity. So just like your home, when you have, say, a $500,000 home, you can have um, a deposit on that. So you can put $100,000 of your own money in. And when you put that money in, that becomes your equity in the house. So you have a $500,000 house. You've got $400,000 from a bank and you've got your $100,000. It's exactly the same I guess, scenario and capital structure for a business, except when you're early in a business, most most times the bank does not want to give you money. It is not going to give you money. If you've just got a kind of like an idea, if you're at the idea stage, you have to go to an investor. So maybe it's a wealthy relative or family member or, you know, someone else that you know, they might be willing to say, hey, you know, I like your business idea. I want 10% of the, the equity in that business for $10,000 or $5,000 or whatever it is. And that might be money that you can invest. And then over the long run, what they get is a percentage ownership of your business. So in three years from today, you make a $10,000 profit. $1,000 of that, you might choose to pay back to that to that investor as a dividend. But this is something that kind of gets into the weeds a bit. And I won't go too much further than to say, you don't necessarily just have to use your own cash, what the bank will give you. Um, or what the bank will give you, you can use, maybe someone else is willing to invest in your, in your business. So that's something that you can, you can take into account. The next thing is, um, you know, the, the, I guess the digital stuff. So one thing that people talk about is domain names. So www.yourbusiness.com.au. Finding that domain name is actually really important. Um, so just as, I guess, a little helpful tip, one of the websites you can use in Australia is called crazydomains.com.au. You can get a, a URL. I don't know the exact pricing. And by the way, I have absolutely no affiliation with any of these things that I'm about to mention. You can get a, a website address for around about $13. Um, and then you can, if it's a simple website, like um, say, I don't know, any website that just has some blank listing, this will give you, um, I guess, authority. So when you speak to people, you might have an email address that's your name at your webdomain.com.au. It's a little bit more legitimate than frank at gmail.com. So what you can do is you can use a company called Flywheel. Again, show notes. 
You can use a company called Flywheel and you can get the domain through Crazy Domains and then you can effectively start your business for around about, or your website for around about 20 bucks a month. You can also use things like Shopify or um, even Facebook has kind of like they're bringing in this new payments app that allows you to build a business effectively in in Facebook. Um, you've got Instagram. If you want to just use a straight up Instagram page, um, they're allowing now people to take payments through that. You could even just set up a Gumtree page so people can find your products or, or whatever you have online. But those are some of the cool free tools uh, or at least cheap, low-cost tools you can use to get started. Um, the next thing is, uh, where do you put all of your information? For us, and a lot of businesses are experiencing that this was a good idea now, is to use an online tool like Google Drive, if you're not familiar. Google Drive is free to start with. Or you could use something like Microsoft. Microsoft 365 is free to start with, I believe, and then you can um, slowly add to it and have your team contribute to documents that you might be using or spreadsheets, etc. Um, the next thing you need to know, and this is a really important one, is I guess the legal setup of your business. When most people start a business, and I'm thinking just, you know, let's say you're a gardening business, you don't typically need to go and get legal advice to start that. You could start as what we call a sole trader, which is where you effectively just do business in your own name and you pay taxes and you're exposed to all of the legal risks in the same way that, you know, I could just go and do someone's gardening or very similar. But the, the thing about um, legal advice early on is not only is it expensive, but it's also important if you're in an industry where things get pretty legal pretty quickly. So if I was starting a finance business today, I would definitely go and get legal advice to understand the best way to set it up. But if you're starting something simple, you might just Google online to see what the differences are. I've put a, a link in the show notes to the ATO tax page, but the difference between a sole trader and a company or um, a bigger type of business is that typically, I want you just to imagine um, there's, I've got three, I've got a piece of paper in front of me and I draw some different circles. There are three circles. One circle is you, another circle is um, your company, and another circle is the customer. Sometimes if the company is in the middle, what happens is if something bad happens to the customer who might be on the other side of the company, it's the company that's responsible in the middle, not you necessarily. And that's what we call a separate legal structure. So a company can, I guess, provide some protection. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so you should go and seek this advice if this is really important to you. But if you're in one of these industries, setting up a company can actually be very handy because it can provide that protection for you and your family at times. Now, there are certain rules and these are changing constantly. So again, um, I've put in a link to the ASIC page for starting a company. But basically what happens is the company opens it up, its own bank account. And so it has company name, bank account. And what you can do with that is you can, the company can pay its own taxes. I've put a link in the show notes to do with taxes and how they're explained. The company can pay its own taxes and you can have your wage or whatever you have um, anywhere else in the world. So you might be doing work for someone else while also starting your business. Uh, you can still earn wage from a wage from someone else and pay tax in your own name, but the company can also be growing and, and taking sales and that type of thing at the same time. So people often ask, okay, should I start a company straight up or should I start as a small business? And it all really depends. So I've put a show note, a show note in starting a business checklist. It's from business.gov.au. But basically my rule of thumb is that the business should be earning a bit of money before you start a company structure. You can always go from being your own business to a company. Um, an accountant would probably want to set you up with a company straight away if this is something you're going to do full time. Um, and that's something you can do. Some accountants charge anywhere between $1,000 and $2,000 to set up a company. From my understanding, actually setting up a company, if you know how to do it yourself, you could probably do it for five or $600. But having the advice is really important and for them to actually do it properly is, properly is important too. Um, so the next thing is, okay, I've got a domain name. I've got, um, you know, I understand the difference between a company and, and an ABN or um, a sole trader. Uh, what else can I do? Well, you've obviously got to get an ABN, so an Australian business number. And I put a link in the show notes where you can get that. So an ABN is typically only reserved for people that actually have a business, not just for people that are you know, doing once-off work here or there, because typically they should be an employee or a casual or something like that. But you can get an ABN online. Um, and then what you've also got to do, and this is different. So, so by the way, an ABN costs you around about, say, $100 for a year or two. Uh, you've got to get a business name. 
Now, just because you get a business name in Australia does not mean necessarily that you're protected for every type of copyright infringement or something like that. So again, this is where legal advice could help. If you're going to go out and get a patent or you're going to create a brand and you think it's really cool, you might want to speak to a lawyer about that first. But in any case, to receive payment in Australia, my understanding is that you need a business name. So you would have to go out and register a business name. Um, You have to make sure it's available. I've put a link in the show notes. And then effectively, when you send an invoice out to someone to get paid, it would have your business name on there. It would have your ABN on there. It would have your address and whether or not you're registered for GST. GST, by the way, is something you only need to register for when you earn over a certain amount of money. So as you're starting out, it's probably not something necessarily you need. So the next thing is, obviously, you want to get a logo drawn up and you want to kind of think about, you know, you're going to get your website done and whatever. Um, You can outsource a lot of this sort of stuff. So you don't need to do it yourself. I mean, I'd do it myself, but I understand how to do it. You could go on something like uh, freelancer.com or Elance or Fiverr or one of these websites to get a logo drawn up. Um, It's a really easy way to do it. Um, just make sure that they haven't used that logo before so you can search the internet for that image because they might just be taking something from another website and saying it's original work or something like that. So just be careful about that. Um, the next thing is we've talked about paying taxes. One thing you have to do when you're uh, starting a business is figure out, okay, how do I pay tax and how much do I pay? Well, you pay if you're a company, you pay tax at a flat rate. If you're an ABN or a sole trader, you pay tax just like you normally would pay tax. But things get a little bit more complicated when you have an employee. And the way you do it with an employee is you would pay their wage. So let's say they earn $1,000 from you. What you have to do is you have to pay their wage less the tax that is associated with them. So when they start, you would get them to fill out a form to say, um, to give you their tax file number, to give you some basic um, information that you need to report to the ATO for. And you would say $1,000 less whatever the applicable tax is. And what's an easy way to do this? How can you keep track of all this sort of stuff? Well, you can use software. So I use software called Xero, X-E-R-O. I own shares in this company, full disclosure. But there's another company called MYOB. And there's another one called Quicken. And there's another one called Reckon. But I use Xero because it's really easy for me. Um, I like the product. And it kind of tells me everything that I need to do. And I can put all of my payments through there. And because I bank with National Australia Bank or NAB, I can um, set it up so they talk to each other and I've got the best of both worlds. I've got a good bank and I've got um, my zero account set up and they're talking to each other. One of the really interesting things is before you hire someone is knowing the difference between what's a full-time, what's a casual, what's a freelancer or contractor and what's, um, I guess, part-time. This is where it's really important for you to seek um, advice from someone who actually knows what's um, how to structure these properly. But one of the things that you can do earlier on is you can make use of freelancers or contractors to do some of the work. So you could outsource if you want to develop something or you could um, pay someone just on a project basis. So they give you an invoice and you pay their invoice. But one of the things that you might want to consider is a full time typically comes with like annual leave, sick leave. Um, You need to have work cover. You need to have all of these different things that you need to pay. Work cover is something that everyone has to have in Australia if they have employees. So that's something that you'll need to get. It's a type of insurance. It covers your employees if they're on the if they're on the work site, wherever they might be, wherever that work site is, um, you'll have to pay a percentage. So it varies, but it might be between say one and two and a half percent of the actual salary of that employee each year. So this is like an actual cost that you've got to pay. There's a, a really useful note in the show notes that I put in, and it's what does an employee actually cost? And so I've done the figures on this. If you have an employee, like a full-time employee, who earns $52,000 a year, let's say for round figures, that's $1,000, it would actually cost you over $65,000 as a business to have that person. Because after you pay super and you have all these other costs. If you have someone that earns, say, $65,000, so they earn a bit more from you, um, that would that would cost over $80,000 every year. And if you have someone that you're paying $100,000 in Australia, that person would end up costing you over $130,000. So it's not necessarily what you see on the tin. There's a lot more that goes inside. And you, as the employer, need to start paying for all of that sort of stuff. And this is just one of the reasons that we have all these different rules and regulations in Australia, and that's the cost that businesses bear. So that's something to consider. The next thing on employees, we've already said that you need to withhold tax. That goes to the ATO every quarter or every month, however you want to do it in your BAS or business activity, BAS statement. The next one you might want to consider is uh, superannuation. One of the most confusing things. I always thought it was as simple as, yeah, they just pay it in and, you know, whatever. You just set it up and it's good to go. Well, 
Paying superannuation is a massive headache and I couldn't find information on this when I first started. Obviously your accountant can help. But basically the way it works is once you've identified your employee's super fund, you have to give them a form by the way, um, within a few days of them starting for them to nominate a super fund. If they don't nominate a super fund, you have to pick one for them. So you have to have a default superannuation fund. And typically your default superannuation fund, let's say it's one of the big ones like Host Plus or Australian Super or REST or whatever it might be. Typically they have this thing called Quick Super. Quick Super. And Quick Super allows you to log in like an employer and say, my zero account told me I have to pay $1,000 in superannuation this month. And then in the Quick Super portal, you'll see, um, okay, how much super do you need to pay and who are the employees? And then you put in all the right stuff there and then it'll come out and say, you need to pay us, as in the Quick Super super company, you need to pay us $1,000. And then when you pay that bill, it automatically gets distributed to all of your employees and their super funds. So then when they check their superannuation balance next month, they can see that you've contributed to their super fund. You generally have until the 28th, I believe it is, I could be wrong on this, 28th the following month to deposit money into their super account. So you want to do that on time, otherwise you risk paying a fine. Now with a contractor, you may not have to pay that. So keep that in mind when you're weighing up whether you have someone as a contractor, um, do some work for you occasionally, or you have someone who is full-time. There are other rules that might stipulate that you need to pay super regardless of whether they're casual, full-time, or part-time, or whatever. So keep that in mind. The next thing is marketing. And um, this is probably the last one that I'll, because I've already run over time, is marketing. So I want you to just write down or go into the show notes and have a look at some of these things that I, I say to you. Thanks to the wonder of the internet, digital marketing, which is online marketing, is one of the most amazing things that you have at your disposal if you're starting a new business. If you're selling t-shirts, you would use Instagram. You would not use Twitter for that because tw Instagram is where you go to get cool photos of, of products and companies. Um, if you are trying to sell an online product, let's say you're selling, I don't know, bags, and they're just generic bags that you know, maybe handle a particular type of camera. I don't know, I'm just looking around the room. You would probably use something like Facebook and Facebook Marketplace for that because you can get people to buy instantly, really, um, and transact with you. You might also use Gumtree. Another thing you might use is app paid advertising on platforms like Facebook uh, where you can target where people live, how much they pay, what they earn, what their interests are, or Google AdWords, which is that first thing you see when someone Googles bags for sale Melbourne or, um, I don't know, keyboard, Mac keyboard for sale Darwin. You can target Mac keyboard and Darwin in Google Ads and you could get a really good um, return on your investment for what you pay to Google for that advertising spot. So all of these things considered, these are digital marketing strategies. And you can also have, obviously, word of mouth, free giveaways, those types of things, they all work wonderfully. What I've done, instead of doing all of this, um, explaining it all here, is to put some links in the show notes. We've got Social Media Explained on the Dummies website. Also, the book Digital Marketing for Dummies is amazing. Um, don't let its name fool you. The, one of the greatest books on marketing ever written, in my opinion, is Permission Marketing. Um, I've put that in the show notes. I've also put in some links to some great um, digital product, I guess, thought leaders uh, in the show notes. So please take a look at that. Uh, one of the things that I also really want to emphasize is, you know, that thing that comes into your email inbox every day at around 4 p.m., you know, that like that marketing, that email marketing. Well, here's a really fun fact as I as I leave you for this uh, long winded business 101 uh, episode. Email marketing is around 43 times more powerful than any other type of marketing. So for every one Instagram follower you, you have. That might not, well, every one email um, you have, rather, that might be worth a few hundred Instagram followers. Because the difference is when you want to hear from a company or when you want to buy a product, the email inbox is where you do business, not social media. So keep that in mind before you go and spend big and you invest a lot into one of these platforms. Um, maybe keep in mind that you want to collect information on your audience and you want to hear from them as much as you can, and you want to operate in spaces where they're operating, where they're most likely to pay you. There was a lot to take in in this episode. I've got a heap, a heap of show notes. Um, I had originally reserved this episode for 10 or 11 different episodes on a new podcast series. So if you want me to go into detail in each of these things, give you step-by-step -step guides on how to do it, 
all the different things you need to know, you just need to email me and just remind me and encourage me to do one of these episodes. Kate's away this week, so I got a chance to to do this. But if you if you need anything, you can use the email in your um, podcast player and you can send me an email. Um, give me some ideas for inspiration for people to uh, to interview on this matter. Next week, we have a video and audio special coming through the Australian Finance Podcast and it is on um, business and how one young woman started a business and has achieved hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram and has created a really successful business for herself. So this is kind of like a primer for that. I've just explained all of the ugly, nitty-gritty things that you need to go to uh, go through to get a business like that off the ground. And then next, we're going to hear from someone who's actually done it. So that's exciting. And I'll leave all of the fluffy and, and squishy stuff for next week. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. As always, I'm Owen Rask. You can find me on Twitter or Instagram, Owen Rask AU. You can email us, Kate or I, podcast at rask.com.au. Send us your ideas. Give us some feedback on this episode. Um, if you know anyone that should be interviewed for an episode like this, um, if you'd want to hear more from me on business, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Okay, as always, uh, happy investing and good luck. Thanks for tuning in. 